Hi everyone. So I'm going to talk about all the metabolic labs that we've done and ones that we were supposed to talk about more in class. So this is going to be the lab about all the metabolic tests. So we're going to talk about enzymes, so exoenzymes, enzymes of respiration, catabolism of carbohydrates, catabolism of proteins, and utilization of nutrients. So all of these labs. Okay, so Again, we talked about this in class, but the reason why you do metabolic testing is to identify a bacterial species. So like we talked about, for example, if you have like a urine culture that you get from a patient and you're trying to identify what bacteria is in it, you could do a series of metabolic tests. I mean, these days people just do DNA sequencing and you can figure out what's there, but metabolic testing is still very valuable to identifying different organisms. And a specific bacteria will have known test results. So we'll have like a profile of what it's positive and what it's negative for. So this is why we do these tests. So you basically take your unknown organism, your unknown bacteria, and you do many different metabolic tests. And then when you look at all the results, you can narrow it down to, for example, do you have Klebsiella pneumoniae? Do you have Yersinia? So these are all different types of bacteria. And we were supposed to do this with the unknown experiments. So the idea of the unknown experiments was everyone was going to be given a culture and you were supposed to determine what bacteria is in your culture. Um, just like, again, if you were given maybe someone's saliva sample or a lung sample or a stomach sample or a urine sample. So this is where metabolic testing is very valuable. And one really nice thing about all these labs is you get to build all your microbiology skills. So the metabolic testing labs that we do in lab are exoenzymes. So you get to test for three different exoenzymes. You're testing if bacteria potentially have amylase, lipase, or gelatinase. These are all exoenzymes, and we will talk about the specifics of that, what that means. You're also testing for respiration enzymes. So we talked about different types of respiration, like aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration. So enzymes that we could test for in lab are a catalase test, an oxidase test, a nitrate reduction test. And these give you an idea of what type of respiration bacteria have. And then carbohydrate catabolism. So to test what types of pathways do bacteria have to break down sugars. And this was from the metabolism lecture. So fermentation of carbohydrate tests, there's something called the MRVP tests, and we will talk about that. And then protein catabolism, do bacteria have the ability to break down different proteins? And remember that protein is made up of amino acids. So you could test for hydrogen sulfide and dull motility tests, which is also called the SIM test, phenylalanine deaminase test, tests for the presence of that enzyme. And again, enzymes are proteins. And then the rapid ornithine decarboxylase test, the urease test. And then there is a final test that you were supposed to do in lab, which is citrate test, which tests to see if you have citrate or not. So for the first section in labs, that was the exoenzymes lab. So for that lab, well, let's talk about exoenzymes in general. So exoenzymes from the name, they're extracellular enzymes that a cell secretes. And these enzymes, the really nice thing about them, if you have them, if you're a bacteria, is they allow you to break down different components, so food, nutrients, and then once they're broken down, it's easier for them to get back into the bacterial cell. So these enzymes help break down large polymers into small ones, which can then enter the cell for use. And metabolism here will assess if you have these exoenzymes. And you basically, the agar, so your medium, has whatever it is, the substrate that the exoenzyme acts on. So if the exoenzyme is present, what will happen is it will digest that substrate, so you'll see a clearing. So you were supposed to test for three different exoenzymes. There is an amylase test, a lipase test, and a gelatinase test, and we'll talk about each one. So we'll start for, with the amylase test. So it tests for the exoenzyme amylase. Amylase hydrolyzes, which means breaks down starch, which is a polysaccharide, a complex sugar. And it, if a bacteria has amylase, what happens is amylase exits the cell, it breaks down starch into its individual monosaccharides, and then those can enter the cell. 
So the growth medium, so to check if bacteria have it, you grow bacteria on starch agar. And after you, so your medium is starch agar, and then all you do is you inoculate the bacteria. You just streak the bacteria on the starch agar, and then you incubate it for 24 hours after you've incubated your plate. For the amylase test, you have to add iodine reagent afterwards because the medium itself is clear, so you can't see the clearing without iodine. And what happens is iodine binds to starch. So if there's no starch because it's been broken down, you'll see a clearing. So a positive result is a clearing, a negative result, you'll just see brown because when iodine binds to starch, you get this brown color. So that was the amylase test. So positive result, again, is a clearing around where the bacteria grew. A negative result is no clearing. Now you still see the growth of the bacteria. It'll still grow regardless because it's starch, it's a nutrient. It's, we're just checking, do they have amylase? So another exoenzyme to test for is lipase. And from the name, it's an enzyme that breaks down lipids. So Lipase hydrolyzes tributyrin, which is a type of triglyceride, which is a type of lipid, a fat, into glycerol and three fatty acids. So if bacteria have lipase, they can break down tributyrin, which is a triglyceride, which is a fat, and then they can take in the monomers of that into the cell for energy. So you're going to grow bacteria on basically fat agar, so tributyrin agar, which is a triglyceride, which is a fat. And for the lipase test, again, if bacteria have lipase, they will break down the tributyrin and you'll see a clearing. If they don't, you'll see no clearing. Finally, the gelatinase test tests for the exoenzyme gelatinase. Gelatinase breaks down gelatin. Gelatin is protein. Um, a lot of people mistake gelatin for fat. It's not fat, it's protein. So they break down gelatin into amino acids because it's a protein and then those can be entered on the cell. So you grow bacteria on gelatin agar and you see, do they have gelatinase to break it? So clearing is positive, no clearing is negative. So those were respiration enzymes. So I have the lab open here with me and you're just going to record the results for different bacteria. And again, that was just streaking the bacteria on the different types of agar plates. Next lab is enzymes of respiration. So respiration enzymes, this is another type of metabolic testing labs. So Metabolic tests can reveal whether bacteria have the enzymes to do aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration, or possibly both. So you're seeing, do they have these enzymes or do they not? And in aerobic respiration, again, as a reminder, oxygen is a terminal electron acceptor and it's reduced to water. In anaerobic acceptor, the terminal electron acceptor is basically anything but oxygen. Um, so it's an inorganic molecule such as nitrate, sulfate, anything iron sometimes testing. So you're going to look at a few enzymes. One enzyme you're going to test for the presence of is catalase. Catalase is an enzyme that's present in aerobic and some facultative anaerobic organisms. So if an organism is aerobic, it does have catalase. So if you didn't know anything about an organism and you knew it had catalase, you'd already know that it can do aerobic respiration. Oxidase is an enzyme that's present in aerobic organisms and some facultative anaerobes. And again, remember facultative anaerobes can do both aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. And nitrate reduction tests, um, tests to see if nitrate can be reduced. And we'll talk about that. And if it can, we have an idea that those organisms are anaerobic organisms. So first for the catalase test. So the catalase test tests for catalase and catalase is an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. It's the same hydrogen peroxide that you buy in the supermarket that you put on wounds. So this is the reason why a lot of people put hydrogen peroxide on a wound because they're scared of getting an infection. So when they cut themselves, they put hydrogen peroxide. And usually when you do, you see bubbling up. And if you see bubbling up, it means that you have, you can have other things, but you could have bacteria there that have the catalase enzyme because the catalase enzyme, it breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen and oxygen is a gas. So that's where you see the bubbles. I did talk to you guys about this, but I also want to mention that this might not be the greatest thing to do because 
you yes harm the you harm aerobic organisms but then you leave the anaerobic bacteria so it might make things worse to put hydrogen peroxide on a wound rather than just wash your hands with soap and water if you get a cut so what you do to test if bacteria have catalase you get the results right away there is no incubation is you take there's multiple ways to do this but the way i've done the test is you can take you put a drop of hydrogen peroxide and then you take a little bit of bacteria and you mix it in and if you see bubbles it means that if you see bubbles with the hydrogen peroxide and bacteria it means that bacteria have the catalase enzyme so a positive test are bubbles because that means you produce oxygen and a negative result is no bubbles. It just stays there. And as a reminder, again, if you have catalase, the bacteria are aerobic and possibly facultative anaerobes. Next enzyme we can test for is the oxidase enzyme. So the oxidase test tests for the enzyme cytochrome C oxidase. And this enzyme is the last component of the electron transport chain in aerobic and some facultative anaerobic organisms. So not to get into the detail of it, but oxidase accepts electrons from cytochrome C, which is another molecule, and donates electrons to oxygen, and then you get water. So what you do with this test is you use this paper strip here. I don't know why this here. I don't know why this image is like this. But anyway, you have a paper strip and the paper strip has this reducing a reagent called NNNN tetramethyl P phenyl anamidine dihydrochloride. So it's a reducing agent basically and it's colorless so if bacteria have cytochrome c oxidase they can oxidize cytochrome and turn the reagent purple because of oxidation so that's what you're trying to test so you take this strip of paper you dip it in this reducing agent and then once you do that you take a little bit of your bacteria and you touch it on your paper that's been saturated with reducing agent and if the bacteria have oxidase they will basically be able to do oxidation and then when they do that you're able to turn that paper strip purple because of the reaction that happened and there's all these charts in your lab manual that you're supposed to fill so you're supposed to for every single test you're doing you have these charts and they're good for studying for your lab practical and for doing your unknown later. So you can see how I filled it out. Okay, finally, nitrate reduction test. So organisms that are anaerobic, they can do many different types of respiration, but one thing they do is they can take inorganic molecules and use them as the final electron acceptors in the electron transport chain. So with the nitrate reduction test, you're seeing if bacteria can use nitrate for metabolism. Can they reduce nitrate? And nitrate is NO3 minus, and if you reduce it, you reduce it to nitrite, NO2 minus, and you can reduce it even further to nitrogen gas. Some organisms can reduce nitrate all the way to nitrogen gas. Um, and if you're able to do that, that's complete denitrification. So you're also testing it. So for these tests, what you're going to do is you're going to grow bacteria in nitrate broth. Here, let me actually show this. Okay, so you, take, you have a broth, so it's liquid. So you take bacteria and you put them in nitrate broth. So imagine I had a tube of nitrate broth and then you incubate them for 24 hours so that the bacteria can grow. And in that tube, there's a little Durham tube. Remember the Durham tubes are the ones where we can see bubbles which indicate gas production. If you grow bacteria in nitrate broth, and you come in after it's been incubated, after it's grown, and you see a bubble in the Durham tube, it means that the bacteria were able to reduce the nitrate, broth, the nitrate broth to nitrite all the way to nitrogen gas. And nitrogen gas is a gas, this is why you see a bubble. It means that they have the enzyme nitrate reductase and they can do complete denitrification. Negative test is you see no bubbles. Now, if you do not see bubbles, you could still test to see, well, can bacteria at least 
take nitrate and reduce it to nitrite, even though they can't do complete denitrification. So on day two of this lab, you do the nitrite test for nitrite production. So after you've grown the bacteria, if they're negative, there's no bubble in the Durham tube, you're going to add different reagents, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and TDR reagent. And if you get a positive result, if you get a purple brown color, um, that means it's a positive result. It means the bacteria can uh, reduce nitrate to nitrite. And if nothing changes, you have to do another test called the nitrate test. So you also want to determine, is there any nitrate in your tube? So a final test is if you saw a negative test in the last one, meaning it was colorless, you're going to take your tube that had the bacteria in it grown in the nitrate broth, and you're going to add zinc. So what zinc does is if there's nitrate in your tube, meaning it wasn't all converted to nitrite or anything, it'll reduce it to nitrite forming a brown color. So if you get a positive result, it means that there was nitrate still in your tube and that's what you're testing for. Okay, so that was the enzymes of respiration. So for respiration, you test catalase test, oxidase test, and nitrate reduction. Now we're gonna talk about fermentation of carbohydrate. These tests are relatively easy. You're basically trying to see, can bacteria use different sugars for their metabolism? So, and remember, if you can use a sugar, you break it or you hydrolyze it into its individual monosaccharides. Bacteria can ferment or use many sugars depending on what enzymes they contain. contain um, and bacteria that ferment a sugar will produce an acid with or without a gas. So if a bacteria can use a sugar for its metabolism, you'll always produce an acid and maybe you'll get a gas as a byproduct, maybe not, but an acid is always produced. So you're gonna test three different sugars to see if your bacteria can ferment them or use them in their metabolism. You'll test glucose, lactose, and sucrose. So there are three different sugars you're gonna grow. You're gonna have, um, glucose broth, lactose broth, and sucrose broth, and then you're gonna inoculate bacteria in all of the tubes, and you're going to see, can bacteria use them or not? And remember, if bacteria can ferment a sugar, like I said, they will produce an acid. And that creates a yellow color in the tube, so if you see a yellow color, you know that that bacteria can use that sugar. They may or may not produce a gas. So your tests, so the growth mediums, you're gonna grow bacteria on glucose, lactose, or sucrose. And all tubes also contain protein and a pH indicator. The reason we add protein in the tubes is because if they, for some reason, cannot use the sugar, we still want them to grow, so you have to add another source nutrient. Um, and protein sparring. So if bacteria can't use carbohydrates for metabolism, they'll use the protein and the protein will cause the medium or the broth to turn blue. Key symbols you guys need to know when you read your tubes after the bacteria have grown, after they've been incubated is A is if you see acid production, if you see yellow, then you know that it's positive, they can use that sugar. Acid and gas is if you see yellow and then an air bubble in the Durham tube. K is the alkaline. It means you see blue and NC is no change and the tubes to begin with are green. Okay, so next test is MRVP test, which is also tests different way bacteria can use sugars for growth. So methyl red Vogus Prosker tests and there are two different tests in one. So it's called the MRVP test, but there is an MR test and a VP test. And you're trying to differentiate different types of enterobacteria. So enterobacteria are a group of bacteria. And you're testing for two different glucose fermentation pathways, the MR pathway or the VP pathway. So the methyl red test looks for the mixed acid pathway. Back, uh, e. coli is a type of enterobacteria, and they do this pathway in their metabolism called the mixed acid pathway. So they create a lot of mixed acids, and they produce lots of organic acids, ethanol, hydrogen gas, and carbon dioxide. The VP test looks for another pathway, the 2,3-putendial pathway, and we see that in enterobacter erogenous bacteria. So enterobacter bacteria usually do the VP pathway, and then E. coli do the MR pathway. So
so for that, we're going to start with the MR test. So for both MR and VP tests, you grow bacteria in MR VP broth. And this broth has sugar, peptone, and a buffer in it. And afterwards, after your bacteria have grown, you add a methyl red indicator. And a positive result is red because of the acid reaction with the pH indicator. That's why it's called methyl red. So if they produced a lot of organic acids and then you add this pH indicator, you get a red color. So that could indicate that you have different E. coli species. Negative result is a two which stays the same color. And then for the VP pathway, Again, it's the same growth medium. That's why they're called MRVP tests. You grow bacteria in MRVP broth. And after your bacteria have grown in it, you add alpha nepothyl and potassium hydroxide. And a positive result is pinkish red because one of the components that's created in the VP pathway is acetoin and it reacts with the reagent creating this pink color. And a negative result is copper. And your lab manual has all the details about this. Finally, the last group of tests um, are the catabolism of protein tests. So you're testing can bacteria catabolize different proteins. So do they have the enzymes to break down different proteins? So there is the SIM test, the sulfide indole motility test. So it's a medium. It tests for three things. It tests for hydrogen sulfide, indole, and motility, and we'll talk about it. And then there's the phenylalanine deaminase test. With this test, you're testing do bacteria have the enzyme, the protein, phenylalanine deaminase, which breaks down different protein. And the rapid ornithine decarboxylase test. And finally, the urease test. So for the SIM test, the SIM test is one test that tells you three things. You get, you get to see hydrogen sulfide, can ba do bacteria, produce hydrogen sulfide. I'll talk about it in a second. Indole test and motility test. So now we're going to talk about the first component of the SIM test, which is hydrogen sulfide. Your testing, do bacteria have an enzyme called cysteine desulfurase? And this enzyme breaks down the amino acid cysteine into hydrogen gas. So if bacteria have it, they do that. And what you do is you have this medium called SIM medium. And SIM medium is, it's not liquid and it's not solid, it's kind of like a jello-like consistency. So this is what SIM medium looks like. And it has iron salts and many amino acids, including cysteine. So what you do is you, you have this tube here, imagine if I had it, you take your bacteria and just you just stab it in and out because it's like jello-like consistency. And then you incubate it. And if you come back and you see a black color, it means that your bacteria do have the cysteine desulfurase test because hydrogen gas was produced. And when H2S gas uh, interacts with iron, you get a black precipitate. And if nothing changes in color, it's negative. They do not have cysteine desulfurase. The next test with that same tube is indole. So in that tube, I didn't show here, in this tube, you stick a strip in it at the top. And this strip, we'll talk about it in a second, it has oxalic acid on it. And in the indole test, you're seeing do bacteria have the enzyme tryptophanase, which breaks down the amino acid tryptophan to form pyruvate, indole, and ammonia. Uh, ammonia. So again, it's the same tube. All these tests are done in the same tube. And the, remember that in the SIM medium, you have a lot of amino acids, such as cysteine. You also have tryptophan. So this paper strip you put on top has oxalic acid on it, and it reacts with indole if it's formed as a byproduct of break, uh, breaking down tryptophan using tryptophanase. You form a pink color on the strip. So any color on the strip after you've incubated means that your bacteria have tryptophanase, so they were able to break down tryptophan and you get indole produced. This is why you get this pink color. No color change means that they do not have tryptophanase. Motility test. Now, I don't think SIM is the best to do motility tests, but it's another byproduct of the test. So you can test if bacteria are motile because with the SIM medium, again, it's jello-like. You stab the bacteria and 
if you look at where you stab the bacteria and you see a lot of fuzzy appearance or the whole tube is black or the whole tube is very saturated, it means your bacteria are motile. If you only see bacterial growth where you actually stuck your needle, it means that bacteria are non-motile. It's not that great for motility. For motility, I would probably do a hanging drop test. But you get this test as a byproduct of doing hydrogen sulfide and indole. And the final test, another test we do to see if bacteria can break down different proteins is phenylalanine deaminase test, and it tests for the enzyme phenylalanine deaminase. So this enzyme is able to deaminate or change, alter phenylalanine the amino acid into phenylpyruvic acid and NH3. So what you do is you take your bacteria and you grow them on phenylalanine agar. So you have this agar, it has phenylalanine on it, and you streak your bacteria on it, you incubate it, and then when you come back, you add ferric chloride. And ferric chloride, if there's phenylpyruvic acid, it'll react with it and form a green color. That indicates that your bacteria do have the enzyme phenylalanine deaminase. And this is why you get a green color. No change means they don't have the enzyme. Another test is the rapid ornithine decarboxylase test. So it tests, do bacteria have this enzyme called ornithine decarboxylase? Um, you guys have taken chemistry, so this enzyme decarboxylates, so it removes a carboxyl group from the amino acid ornithine and produces an amine and carbon dioxide. So you grow bacteria on this rapid ornithine broth, which has ornithine, and you're seeing can bacteria remove the carboxyl group using the enzyme ornithine decarboxylase? Do they have it? If they can, you get a purple color um, because this putrescine is alkaline and because it's alkaline and there's a pH indicator, it turns the medium or what you grew your bacteria in purple. Urease test. So urease test tests for the enzyme urease. Urease is an enzyme which can break urea into NH3 and CO2. There's a lot of urea in the stomach, and I've talked about this in lab. So H. pylori, that bacteria, the reason it can infect the stomach so well and cause stomach ulcers is because it has urease. So this test tests for do bacteria have urease. So what you do is you grow bacteria on urea agar, which has a phenol pH indicator. If they do have urease, they produce a lot of basic products because they're breaking down urea and this NH3 um, ammonia is a basic product. And so you get this hot pink color. Um, I had this question here, why would H. pylori, which causes gastritis and stomach ulcer, need this enzyme to survive? If you, the stomach is very acidic. If you don't have urease, most bacteria are killed by the stomach's acid um, because remember, acids are very reactive from chemistry. So organisms that have urease can break the acidic product of the stomach and make it more basic. Another final test that you will do is a citrate test. It tests for citrate permease and this enzyme it takes citrate and breaks it down to pyruvate and CO2. So if organisms have citrate permease, they can break down citrate. And citrate can be used as a carbon source for some bacteria, so that's why they have this enzyme. So what you do is you grow bacteria on Simmons citrate agar, which contains a pH indicator. And green means that its neutral pH is 6.9. Blue indicates basic alkaline products. So if bacteria do have citrate permease, they can break down citrate into pyruvate and CO2. CO2 reacts with other products to form alkaline products. And remember from here, the pH indicator, when it's alkaline, it results in a blue color. So a green color means negative, they do not have the enzyme. And the objectives for all of these metabolic tests are to go back and study your charts. So for your lab practical, know how to do tests for your unknown. Know the test name, what you're specifically testing for. Um, so for example, a test name could be the urease test. It's testing for the enzyme urease, medium or substrate or any reagents used. No, you just grow the bacteria on urea agar and a positive result is a hot pink color, a negative result, the color doesn't change. The reason for a positive result is because you form 
basic products from the ammonia and be able to read these tests if given them on your lab practical. So that is it for that metabolic testing lab. So look at your lab, read your lab.